with rock and roll. Um, thanks for joining us, ladies and gents. Uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, I'm Dave Cocking from Design Builder Software, uh, and I'm delighted that I'm joined today by Jim Dirks from the US firm Building Performance Team. Jim captained Team DBs during the recent ASHRAE Lowdown Showdown competition. And I'll also be joined by Design Builders Manager Director Andy Tyndale and DB's team members Aaron Baranian and Waylee Sue during the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. So the webinar is intended to showcase the work of Team DBs and how they use Design Builder or DB to design a net zero healthcare building with a focus on health and well-being. Today we'll be using a mixture of PowerPoint slides and some design builder models to talk you through the DB's workflow from start to finish. What we're not trying to show today is some kind of prescriptive process for designing net zero healthcare buildings. So our intention is really to show you what the team did in the context of the competition, which we hope will give you some useful insights into areas of design and modeling that you may not otherwise have considered. The webinar will last around an hour and there'll be time for questions at the end. So please feel free to send them via the webinar control panel. There is a little uh, question input section there. Um, send them as they arise and we'll work through them later. Many of you viewing today may not be familiar with Design Builder, so I'll provide a brief overview before we dive into the competition modeling details. So what is Design Builder? We like to think of it as a fully integrated multidisciplinary simulation toolbox. The Design Builder graphical user interface provides access to open source simulation engines such as Energy Plus and Radiance in much faster, easier and more productive ways. DB is the most capable and mature third party interface to the Energy Plus simulation engine and unlike most simulation tools Design Builder is actually well suited to analyzing building performance at any stage of the project, from stage testing, through detailed design, and then on to certification with schemes such as LEED. A core ethos of Design Builder is that the various tools are fully integrated. So all the analyses that you can see on this overview are directly available from a single model. We generally start with a core 3D geometric model as you can see in the middle of this image and this can either be imported from tools such as Revit and SketchUp or quickly and easily drawn in DB. The model is then developed using our industry leading data management processes which minimize data input time help to reduce input errors and actually maximize productivity. You can conduct all of the main energy and comfort related analyses you'd normally expect from a mainstream simulation tool and more. So taking each of these main features or feature groups uh, in this overview image in turn, once you've created the model you can calculate uh, costs, so that would be construction, operation, life cycle costs. You can model HVAC systems very simply at early stage or in great detail using our schematic HVAC system creation tools. Sizing calculations can be run to determine heating and cooling plant loads and zone emitter sizes at winter and summer design conditions. Design Builder can help you generate the data and outputs required for code and certification with schemes such as WELL, BRIAM and LEED. 
This slide highlights the workflow of automating the, the ASHRAE 90.1 baseline building and HVAC generation, then automating the simulations to produce comparative proposed versus baseline results for lead submissions. Fully integrated daylighting analysis from the same model using radiance. We also provide a range of rendering and visualization tools and easy methods for applying window blinds, louvers, overhangs, etc. A wide range of typical solar shading systems can be analyzed as well as more advanced facade types such as building integrated photovoltaics and multi-state electrochromic glazing. Our simplified CFD tools enable regular simulation modelers without necessarily having any prior CFD experience to undertake internal and external CFD analysis again using the same model. Energy Plus thermal simulation results can be imported directly from the simulation and into the CFD as boundary conditions for the analysis. In the context of health and well-being, we can use CFD to analyze external pedestrian comfort and internal zone comfort conditions in much more detail. Optimization is an advanced and automated form of cost-benefit analysis to help find the best combination of design variables. This is a tool right at the cutting edge of mainstream modeling and a powerful way of finding the best trade-off between often conflicting design requirements at both the early and detailed stages of your project. More on this later. We'll touch on most of these capabilities during the course of the webinar in the context of the project and as they were used by the team. So now on to the detail of the project to design the net zero healthcare building. An important point to note here, just to put the project in context, is that the work you're about to see was done by a volunteer team with busy day jobs in a little over two months. The work that they and the other teams in the competition did in such a short time scale was quite remarkable. I'd like to take this opportunity again to thank all of the DB's team members for their hard work and positive and proactive attitudes towards the project. During the webinar, I'll highlight the main areas that each team member was involved in. Consideration of health and well-being in building design isn't new in itself, but recent developments like the introduction of the well building standard are helping to highlight its importance. Secrete had recent experience of a healthcare building designed with health, health and well-being in mind, and he made a strong case for this as an approach to the competition. Looking at these images, I'm sure you'll agree that you can see why. This second image in particular really sold the concept to me. How unusual to see an MRI or treatment room with a calming view to exterior planting. How nice would it be for staff and patients to occupy a building like this compared to traditional, potentially sterile feeling healthcare buildings. I guess the only people not so keen on the design would be the gardeners. They might see things they'd rather not if they inadvertently went to do a little weeding at the wrong time. I'll now hand over to Jim. And he's been waiting patiently to explain how the team went about the early design stages. Thanks, Dave. It's, I don't have to have too much patience. Uh, so I'm going to start describing a little bit about how the team approached the project. And in the context of the competition, every, every team needed a name. And we picked the name DBs in part because it's how design builders often refer to, but also uh, because the US Navy Seabees, uh, who were a construction battalion back, I think they're still around, but their motto was 
a very can-do model. The difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. This was not an impossible task, but it was difficult, and we embraced the challenge. Our hive, so to speak, for the DBs, consisted of seven people spanning eight time zones, ranging from the UK to California. And it was, none of us had worked together before on anything approaching this level of complexity, but we were complements of GoToMeeting and other kinds of tools, collaboration tools, we were able to work together efficiently and got the project done on time and in good fashion. We're going to highlight the roles, or as we call them, superpowers of each of the team members as we go through the project and uh, you'll get to know a little bit more about who contributed what. One of the unique uh, aspects of this project was, uh, I guess we'll start saying that if you're familiar with LEED certification, you're aware that the baseline building and the proposed building are identical in shape and form. For this project, the competition uh, said that the baseline building was fixed, but the proposed building could have a completely different shape. And in fact, pretty much the only constraint was that both needed to be three uh, stories. And so we said, how do we view that in the terms of uh, you know, what we're trying to accomplish? So we made our own owner program requirement for a fictitious client called American Permanente. And we said that they had been building a certain type of outpatient healthcare facility for a number of years, but they wanted a next generation facility that would meet several uh, new requirements. One is that the building had to be a model for occupant health and well-being. The other is that it would create a platform for future outpatient health care facilities for this American Permanente system. It had to be economically reproducible. In other words, it wasn't a monument, uh, you know, one-off type design. And it had to have exceptional energy efficiency. And, and they defined exceptional as at least 30% better than what they currently had. So that was our context. The baseline was fixed. It was what they used to do. This proposed design was going to meet these new updated criteria. So as Dave mentioned, uh, Sakrit, uh, one of our teammates, uh, proposed this emphasis on health and well-being. That made great sense to us. And so we wanted to focus heavily on the health and well-being, not only of the patients, but also the staff. And use our creativity uh, and best practices to save energy as a supporting role. So we had a strong emphasis on daylighting and views, on thermal comfort, and proper ventilation for this health-focused facility. At the same time, we wanted to achieve the lowest possible energy use index without renewables, even though the competition allowed us to use renewables. And we also wanted to leverage readily available HVAC systems so that it wasn't a uh, so that it was economical and reproducible. This is the baseline design that we started with. As it happens, the competition uh, steering committee gave us a, an Energy Plus input data file uh, defining the building in great detail. And we said to ourselves, well, we don't want to you know, completely reproduce this on our own manually. So Aaron did the, uh, a little creative work here to export the or import the IDF into Open Studio and then Open Studio essentially we exported that into a GBXML file which is something that Design Builder could read and so we imported the GBXML uh, file into Design Builder and as Aaron reported there were and you're, some of you are aware of this when you do that kind of import there's sometimes big gaping holes well there are very few and so it went very smoothly and probably a testament of uh, Design Builder's integratability. So I think I'm going to hand this back to David now, and he can carry on. Super, thank you, Jim. So, as you've seen, or heard from Jim, the competition rules were such that the proposed building was created from the baseline. A little unusual for the real world, but actually makes a lot of sense for a competition. Sadly, this reverse process didn't give the team 
the opportunity to use Design Builder's new auto baseline generation tools that create the baseline from the proposed building. So we'll now take a quick look at the baseline model that you can see here. As Jim just outlined, the team imported the healthcare reference building IDF into Open Studio and then exported a GBXML file from there into Design Builder. For those of you wanting to import IDF into Design Builder, this is currently the best way we've seen of doing it. The team had to do it this way um, because Design Builder can't yet import IDF data directly. IDF import is on our short term development plan and we anticipate it being available next year. The building geometry was created by the GBXML import that you see here. And Aaron was, uh, I think, very pleased to be able to say that there was very little editing required of the, um, of the geometry when it came into Design Builder. So here's the second floor of the baseline. and the third floor. Once the geometry was complete, the team set about creating templates. More on that from Jim soon. Um, and these were used to quickly input the model data for activities, constructions, etc. So we'll take a quick look at the, uh, the baseline HVAC or HVAC system, which in this case is a System 5 packaged VAV with reheat. This was created by loading System 5 from the Design Builder ASHRAE 90.1 library and tailoring it to meet the specific competition requirements. Those of you using the IDF editor to, to create detailed HVAC systems will appreciate the amount of time a schematic approach to HVAC definition could save by automatically making all of the correct HVAC node connections. Once the baseline building was created, the model and results were QA checked with the other team members. So the baseline then gave us our minimum energy performance goal to shoot at, but ultimately we wanted to get to net zero. I'll now hand back over to Jim, who will talk you through the next stage of the project. Oh, we're having slight technical difficulties. There we go. The, as we began to consider the proposed building design, uh, we wanted to become as familiar as possible with the Nebraska climate. None of us actually live in Nebraska and so we're not as familiar. So Aaron used the climate consultant software to investigate, this is very early, the suitability of Nebraska's climate for an assortment of energy related design strategies. Then uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab had produced this chart which we were unaware of but Secrete was aware of and so we took a look at this as an example of typical renewables uh, applicability in different parts of the country. And Nebraska, kind of in the center of the U.S. here, is uh, particularly suitable for wind power. There's some biomass potential because there's lots of uh, farms in the area and also hydropower. The, uh, Omaha sits right on the Missouri River, which is on the eastern border of the state. As we began, we, we looked at the project requirements and said, oh my goodness. It was a lot of detail for what's essentially an early design model. So we co collected all of those requirements for different temperature set points, different schedules, different ventilation rates, different air change rates, and put them in a spreadsheet and kind of sorted them out to see what we had. Well, it turned out there were 30 unique combinations of all those variables. And we put those together. And then we said, what do we do with them? How do we make sure that we incorporate those correctly in the model. Well, as it happens, Design Builder has a nifty data management tool called a, an activity template. We define all those 30 as unique requirements 
And the way it works inside the software is that you, you define general information about the particular activity, of the, as they call it, an activity template. That includes some scheduling, uh, and it's just a, a, a category holder. Then you can define occupancy information, how many people are in the zone, what their metabolic rate is, what schedule they occupy. You can uh, define other gains from different sorts of equipment. Uh, domestic hot water use that's specific in the schedule uh, by which it's used as well as environmental control requirements like temperature set points and schedules for occupancy and a host of other things so all of these are part of a single activity template and once you've defined that template you save it and you can then apply it to as many zones as it's um, applicable to and then of course other people can check it easily and by the way if there's a change that you say oh we forgot this or we didn't include that uh, you, you apply it to the template and then all the zones are correctly updated as a part of the template process so we made extensive use of these to both in, improve quality and reduce labor effort Secrete and Chitra were our architectural wizards, and that was their superpower. And the, the design of the proposed building took on quite a different shape compared to the baseline. Uh, that, that design is shown here, and I'll just mention a couple details about it. The two sizable courtyards in the building were put there in large part because we wanted the people in the building to have those lovely views of a pleasant exterior and notice that each of the floors uh, have some they're, they're terraced and there are so there are places that can be immediately outside the windows as well as the view to the, the sky and the general exterior so the idea is to have some essentially healing green spaces because we also expect that there would be um, plantings there this is uh, we're highlighting the terraces on the exterior of the building but the image shows uh, an idea of how that could be presented for the building. This isn't, a, this isn't our building, it's another, I think, project that Secrete was involved in. So that's the big picture. We want to have these tiered terraces, green spaces that enhance the sense of health, peace, and well-being throughout the facility. This image is one that David highlighted earlier and essentially uh, not only from every other occupied room in the building but from even operating suites you have a view of a courtyard or outdoors and that's unconventional for operating rooms but the idea is to provide a calming effect especially to a patient for a very high stress situation so I'm thinking I'd like to be cared for there I'd like to have whatever outpatient surgery and I'd also like to work there this is the tool this is our particular building and we wanted to take some effort to impact or assess the sun's impact uh, seasonally but this was a particular design day and we, we could and did look at other days as well uh, using the design builder sun visualization tool and then in addition Secrete took a more detailed look outside of design builder at using software called light stanza which, which can generate plots for daylighting metrics like this one which is showing spatial daylight autonomy. Uh, the capability to do this within Design Builder is planned for early 2017 as I understand it using DaySim which is a widely known uh, open source uh, lighting protocol. So this is our architect's rendering of what we're calling the sensible design and I'll explain that a little bit later but you can see there are PV panels on the roof and it's a, a lovely space with the, the courtyards, green spaces, and terraces are actually on the back. And then, of course, this is what it looks like from within Design Builder. So it, it's much the same, just uh, in fact, exactly the same. I'm going to hand back the presentation to Mr. Cocking and let him continue. <coughs> Okay, thank you again, Jim. Um, so we 
decided to optimize the building form in the good old-fashioned way uh, really based solely on the considerable experience and expertise of our team architects Sucrete and Chitra and we felt that this was appropriate for, for the competition we also didn't want low energy to be the be all and end all of the design as is so often the case but we more wanted it to be a byproduct of good design ultimately we wanted to create a building that staff and patients like being in and one that could be efficiently and cost effectively constructed and operated ideally we'd have liked to utilize passive measures such as natural ventilation but the nature of a healthcare building strict comfort requirements plus the um, early stage analysis that Aaron did on the Nebraska climate meant that natural ventilation for air quality and cooling purposes were ruled out um, pretty early on. Fresh air ventilation rates are obviously an important part of health and well-being and the relatively high ventilation requirements for healthcare facilities meant we didn't need to do anything more um, to ensure a well ventilated building. The health and well-being focus made daylight availability, sky views and views to green planting in the natural environment a key consideration that heavily influenced the building form. As Jim mentioned, Secrete and Chitra were instrumental in bringing that concept to life through a series of initial sketch designs to ensure, as far as possible, that frequently operate, uh, occupied rooms had good daylight avail availability and uh, a good view to the outside. The building form was then honed to ensure it contained the required floor area which was mandated in the competition rules for each of the, the main activity types in the building. Once they'd done that, the architect's CAD plans were imported into Design Builder and used as templates for the team to create the geometry that you see here, which is basically the same geometry as the, uh, the slide that, that uh, Jim showed. And you can quite clearly there see the uh, courtyards on both sides of the building and that fairly interesting uh, little uh, cut through feature there. So some fairly unique, uh, interesting features created by uh, Sucrete and Chitra. The competition allowed for uh, 10,000 square foot of, of PV. Uh, we could only fit around half of that on to the roof of the building. So you can see here we've got fairly limited um, roof space. So we basically used uh, covered car parking spaces, uh, the roofs of which were created by PV panels to give us the extra 5,000 square foot. The PV design and the layout was done using the experience of the team to set the correct tilt angle and spacing for the location. I'll just go back to the models edit screen now and we'll take a quick look at the floor layout uh, on each of the, the three floors. I'll just put the model into plan view. So here's the, um, the ground or the, the first floor, floor one. Here's the second floor. And you can see these floor plans, there's, uh, there's actually quite a lot of work involved. There's a lot of zones uh, required in this particular building. And here's the upper story, the top story, floor three. So looking at these plans, you can see how the architects tried to provide natural light and views into the most frequently occupied spaces while still complying with those competition requirements regarding floor area for each activity type. 
There are, of course, some additional considerations with healthcare buildings um, where glazing sill heights may need to be a little lower than ideal for maximum daylight penetration so that you've got outside views for non-walking patients and visitors. I'll now hand back to Jim and he'll talk you through the later stages of the design. Because we wanted a practical and replicable design, Jung did a bunch of research into best practices for building systems for this type of building. Each image on this slide represents a document that she referenced and that we referenced during the, the design process. Uh, and this, what I think she's only shown about half here because she just did a, a whole boatload of research to make sure we were as well informed as we could be. Uh, the, the research essentially showed what Dave mentioned a moment ago that for clinical spaces uh, and particularly with the air change and ventilation requirements, and that was by the way the entire first floor, that a VIV system with reheat was going to be best suited to meet those hygiene and ventilation requirements. We then uh, decided to, well we wanted to create the HVAC system within Design Builder and the interesting aspect of doing it graphically is that I think it makes it a lot easier for each of us to check the other work. In other words, we look at the schematic and we say, yep, that's exactly what we're trying to do, as opposed to going through a bunch of text or uh, less obvious information. When we created the system, uh, we wanted to do an initial sanity check about whether, in fact, it was doing what we expected. Design Builder has visualization tools within it that in this case are showing uh, annual uh, operation or conditions for temperatures and energy use and heat balance and a variety of other things so that we could get the, a sense that in fact it was working as we intended. But that big picture was something that we essentially drilled down and used uh, the what they call the results viewer tool, tool for Design Builder to look in close detail, in this case over a several day period, but you can actually drill down to hourly if you want. This happened to be for a condenser loop, but the idea was to do detailed checking for uh, temperature control of plant loops, temperature control of zones, outdoor air control for all those zones so that we made sure we were accomplishing our health and well-being goals in the, in the midst of the energy calculation. And then just because I'm a detailed engineer and like to investigate things in more detail. We exported every 10 minutes of data and looked in, and as it turned out, there were a few hidden problems, things we hadn't seen earlier, which we identified and then corrected. So at the end of this exercise, we felt like we had a essentially bulletproof uh, energy calculation model. Now, Calculating energy is one thing, but you can't get away from construction cost as a constraint. A true optimization can't just look at energy cost, it has to look at the balance between how much it costs to build something and how much it costs to operate. So we used Design Builder's uh, library of construction costs, but we also added to it using RS means data for a variety of everything from wall constructions to glazing to lighting systems to the HVAC systems that we were looking at as well as the renewables. I'm going to hand it back to Dave now and he'll continue. Okay, so Jim just mentioned cost which actually leads me very neatly into the team's cost benefit analysis or optimization study. To use cost as an optimization objective, it is of course essential to input the cost of all the major components in the building, so your fabric, your lighting, HVAC systems, etc. So firstly, the team decided which uh, fabric, glazing, shading, lighting, HVAC systems were appropriate and created templates for each of them. So, for example, they created specific construction templates that reflected high, medium, 
and low thermal resistance or, or U-value um, constructions. The model that I've uh, that I've got open now is the the same building model you saw earlier, but this time with the optimization results stored, as you can as you can see uh, on the screen. Given the form of the building was already fixed um, from Secrete and Chitra's early work, the optimization study was used by the team to ensure that the remaining key parameters were taken into consideration. Uh, to give us a, a holistic overview of the, the relationships between all of the, uh, the important variables. So the designers needed to really understand how the individual components of the building perform together at different times of the year, where changing one design variable has a knock-on effect on other variables. For example, changing the orientation that changes the optimum window to wall ratios, which affects the available areas for building integrated photovoltaics and the required shading on each facade. And that affects the solar heat and light gains, which in turn affect the lighting gains when utilizing daylight controls, thermal mass and building response time, HVAC efficiency, and heating and cooling loads. It's a similar analogy to a sports team where you can optimize either at the individual player level, i.e. the individual building component level, or at the team level, i.e. the building level, finding players that are likely to work well together. You can have a team full of the best players on the planet, so the individual team components are optimized, but success is more often achieved with a group of players that complement each other rather than necessarily all being individually brilliant. A great example of this was Leicester City winning the English Premier League last year, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. This was really due to the ability of the manager to get the best synergy between his players. So the whole team became greater than the sum of its parts. The Leicester team was optimised rather than all of the players necessarily being individually world-class themselves. Of course, if you can have both, then all the better. So to achieve truly opt optimal building performance, you really have to consider how these key design variables interact with, with each other. And the only way to do that in a realistic time scale is to use optimization. Given the emphasis on daylighting for health and well-being, the team were particularly interested here in the impact of glazing and shading changes. Given more time, I'm sure this study could have been refined, possibly split into stages, but time constraints meant selecting key variables and using the results from this study to help inform the team's decision making. Before we look at the results, I'll review the optimization settings dialog. And you can see here that the uh, design objectives are shown on this first tab in the dialog. And the objectives of this study were to minimize the capital cost or capex and to minimize net site energy. There were no constraints set, but we could, for example, have set a maximum value for capital cost to exclude solutions with a capex over $5 million, say, or exclude solutions with high unmet load hours. Here you can see the design variables we used. The window to wall percentage, you can see here, was allowed to vary from 30% to 80% in 5% increments. Building orientation was allowed to vary from 0 through 350 degrees in 10 degree increments. Constructions options were high, medium and low U-value templates with both building integrated PV and non-BIPV options 
for each um, construction type. Glazing options were quadruple glazing, triple glazing and double glazing units with the double glazing having high, medium and low solar and light transmission options. The lighting options were LED, T5 and T8 fluorescent each with and without daylight controls. And our HVAC options were the ASHRAE 90.1 Baseline Building System 5, you saw um, a little earlier. A ground source heat pump and VRF systems, each of which had uh, with DOS and each of which had um, different separate options for DOAS supply air temperatures of 15, 17, 19 and 21 degrees C. So we had a whole bunch of, uh, of different options for each of our main design variables. You can see at the bottom of the screen that we applied the shading um, variables um, to the different facades of the uh, of the building. We had a, a good variety of shading options ranging from no shading to a variety of projection lengths um, for different shading types so we had some overhangs, some louvers uh, and some mixed overhangs with side fins etc. For those of you running optimization studies you should really know it's important to also have the no shading option um, so that the optimizer can select that if in it feels that there are um, or that, that, that no shading is, is the best option for a particular facade. So I'll just cancel the uh, settings dialog and go back here to the results that the optimization results that you can see within the design builder interface. So as you've just seen from the, uh, the uh, settings dialog, this optimization study was used to help find the uh, optimum design solutions that minimized net site energy, which you can see here on the y-axis, and also to minimize uh, capex, which you can see here on the X axis. Amongst many other things, um, Whaley managed our optimization process and he assessed 10 sets of design variables, as you've just seen, with all possible combinations running into several millions of different permutations. Clearly, it isn't possible to manually assess that number of different simulations, each with its own unique combination of design variables. Because Design Builder employs a genetic algorithm, which intelligently searches the solution space containing all combinations of design variables, finding the optimum solutions only required hundreds of simulations instead of millions. The optimization search method is often likened to survival of the fittest, natural evolution, where the optimizer identifies the strongest solutions, i.e., those with the best, which or those that best meet the design objectives that you've set, and then it focuses its search effort on similar variable combinations. This point of clouds or cloud of points even, um, <laughs> in the scatter plot shows all of the individual simulation results for this study. Each result based on different combination of the design variables that we've chosen. The optimal design solutions are shown as the red points you can see here at the leading edge of the point cloud. This is a range of optimal designs for further discussion and analysis depending on where the owner 
or the design team wants to be on the cost performance spectrum. And it's a great starting point for discussion. So what did this particular optimization study tell us? The results of the study, which ran overnight on a network server, helped the team to very quickly identify trends in the optimal solutions. The optimal designs tended to have lower glazing percentages. So if I just go to the top here of the, um, the results set um, to, to our Pareto optimal solutions, you can see that the, um, the window to wall ratios at the top tended to be um, lower. And orientations were, were typically um, not too far from south, uh, largely to maximize the impact of PV. There were clear preferences um, in many solutions for relatively inexpensive uh, double glazing, as you can see here. LED lighting, um, mostly, with daylight control. VRF, variable refrigerant volume, with DOAS for non-clinical areas. And varying degrees of shading um, on all facades except north, which generally had none, or certainly less. In the, the cloud uh, of all the, showing all the results here, you can see a gap at this point here between um, what appear to be two clusters of, of results. So why might that be? These, um, this clustering and the way the results cloud forms can often give us uh, clues into the important aspects of the design and what's driving um, the design. By interrogating the optimal points in the cloud, we discovered that all solutions to the right of this gap, so those solutions down here, included BIPV. But those to the left of the gap don't. So those solutions over here to the right tend to have a higher cost and a lower net site energy, which makes perfect sense when you think about um, what BIPV would do for your design. And the converse is uh, obviously true for those on the left side. Lower capital cost, but uh, slightly higher energy consumption. So what the cloud helps us to visualize is that the significant extra cost for BIPV may not actually be worth the modest increase in energy savings in this particular case. So we'll take a look at the two points here on either side of this, um, these, either side of this small gap. And we can see if we look at the last of the BIPV solutions here on the right hand side, if I click on that point, it takes me to iteration number 241 and I can see the selected variables for that here. We can also see that uh, iteration 241 has a capital cost of around about $4.8 million um, and a net site energy of around about 750,000 kilowatt hours. Iteration number 245 here on the left hand side of the gap, so that's the solution with no BIPV, has a very similar net site energy, around about 750,000 kilowatt hours, but a significantly lower, to the tune of about $600,000 lower, capital cost. So after discussing these options and the results, the team selected the non-BIPV solution, uh, and we actually chose this one, solution 245, is giving us the best trade-off between cost and performance. Interestingly, when we look at the selected shading options for that particular solution, which you can see on the right-hand side here, it basically confirms that um, we need less shading on the east, and um, 
that, that can help us to optimize for beneficial gains from morning sun during the colder parts of the year and it's um, giving us more shading on the south and west um, westerly aspects of the building to optimize between daylight and cooling loads so it's actually really liberating to be able to visualize results in this way and see the impact of so many interconnected variables in this project it really helped the team inform decision making one point worth noting for those of you um, existing design builder optimization users there is a relatively new feature um, up on the, the toolbar here to apply the selected results from the model um, or, or to the model should I say so you can choose a solution in the points cloud and then by clicking on this icon load those results into the current model So I'm now going to hand you back to Jim and he'll talk you through a little bit more of the uh, optimization analysis that helped us uh, make sense of those uh, results a little deeper and take us through the results of the proposed design. Wei Li is clearly our optimization uh, guru and he looked even beyond the analysis of the point cloud that David was just conducting and used some tools that aren't quite ready for the market uh, but are in the later stages of development at Design Builder. One of them is a bubble plot. This is, and remember there's so much data that you now can begin to analyze that you never had before. It can become a little bit uh, intimidating and, and, and so it makes good sense to have additional tools to highlight the the trends or the uh, the way that data is influ or the changes are influencing the results. This uh, this bubble plot is a nice way of doing that. The different colors in this case are sh reflecting different lighting schemes, and the size of the bubble reflects not you know, the color is the lighting scheme. The size of the bubble is the wall to window ratio. So bigger bubble means higher wall to window ratio. So you start to be able to see uh, a little bit more clearly what's going on uh, using that sort of visualization tool and then another one is the parallel coordinate chart the the way for example that minimum capex occurs is through a combination of a variety of other variables in this red uh, line is highlighting those and you can drill down in this parallel coordinates chart to see individual or subsets of variables to see how they end up producing uh, capex and energy the attendant energy consumption but it's it looks kind of messy when you see the whole thing all together but then the key feature is that it can be uh, filtered or fine-tuned to examine particular aspects this is the uh, ground coupled VRF system and uh, DX uh, system 5 that we used. The, the system 5 approach was used for the, the clinical floors. The other two floors used the VRF with the OAS and uh, in part because Omaha has a pretty cold climate, VRF doesn't work particularly well when it gets really cold out and so the ground coupling uh, was a way to improve its performance year-round as well as take uh, out the several hours of the year where the VRF was having a hard time on, on just a handful of zones. So that entire system was created within Design Builder and if you were to do it using a uh, manual editor in Energy Plus you'd probably spend weeks. This only took minutes or maybe a little bit longer. Now the results. Uh, of all that effort. Uh, the, the baseline performance was something like what you would expect. Those of you familiar with site energy use index indices are, are going to be saying that looks fairly reasonable for a baseline. And by the way, this was to the ASHRAE 90.1 2010 standard. So it's a higher bar than most of your projects are probably using. When we looked at the optimized envelope design without any renewables whatsoever, 
we saw a 45% reduction. That's pretty good. And it easily beat our 30% our goal from the owner program requirement. And there are a couple of interesting things here. One is that because we had those courtyards, we had a lot more glass area than the baseline building. And we still saw the 45% reduction, which was kind of incredible, but we double checked it a, a bunch and we're confident of that. And then another interesting aspect, uh, Jung's research indicated that, or maybe it was Chitra, I, I think I lost track and I apologize to either of those women, but reduced employee sick leave, reduced patient stay period, and an assortment of other cost benefits indicate that for this building, we probably would be saving over a million dollars a year for those reasons alone, let alone the improved energy performance. Well, that's the no renewables option. What we called the sensible option was the competition 10,000 square feet of TV panels and, and as we chose it. And that improved things yet further to a 56% improvement over the baseline. And we still, of course, retain that um, soft um, cost savings for employee sick leave and such. And then finally, for the lowdown showdown and our goal of achieving net zero, we said what other things could be done. And remember, this is a pretty challenging net zero project because of the ventilation and air change requirements. And we elect, there were several renewables technology that we could have used in Nebraska, including, as we mentioned, wind, biomass, uh, hydro. We chose a wind tower and put that on the site and got essentially a dramatic result, cash back for the owner, a net positive energy cost of 21 cents a square foot. We're, we're actually way beyond net zero and we still have the over a million dollars, almost a million and a half dollars in uh, soft employee cost savings. So that was pretty dramatic and it was kind of cool to, to see that progression and, and basically find out that we could do it. So we're, we've got a proposed design which is, uh, was a challenging OPR, but we felt like we nailed it. That, one of the, Aaron said it this way, the buzz is real. And uh, we had teammates who came together for the first time ever, worked together very effectively, and we had a creative, we felt unique design that focused on the most important things of health and well-being, but used energy to the very po best possible um, methods. We had several simulation tools going on within Design Builder, and then uh, we ended up with a cost-effective, constructible, uh, real-world project that is actually well suited for uh, growth in either different uh, renewables as their costs change. Uh, it's well suited to um, continue to perform that well or better in the future. So as a result of that hard work, we, uh, we got the best energy performance award that was very affirming and very encouraging. This is all of our team except for Sakrit and Chitra who had to leave just before that presentation was made. And we've got uh, Tony Giametti from ASHRAE, uh, Drew Crawley and Dennis Knight who were part of the steering committee and were a great support and good people to, to work with. So we were, we were happy at the conclusion of that effort. I'm going to hand it back to Dave. And we'll continue. Okay, brilliant. Thanks again, Jim. Um, so that's hopefully given you all a sense of the way the team approached the competition and has hopefully also provided you with some useful insights. We'll now open the webinar for your questions and Jim and I will be joined by Andy, Aaron and Wei Li. Please give us a minute or two to review the questions you've sent so far and feel free to ask more now. So we'll be back with you in a minute.